Around midnight, we went to buy cigarettes from the partisans. And where the forest became thicker about a mile upriver, where big blocks of red granite thrust upward through the grass, we stopped and waited. It was raining. The rain fell from a high, luminous midnight sky. One of those transparent arctic midnights of polished aluminum. Muffled birdsong filtered through branches of red pine and white birch, and the voice of the river rose and fell like the light from a kerosene lantern. Suddenly, the partisans appeared. Young, blonde, tall, thin, with red cheeks and blue eyes, impeccably dressed in allied uniforms, jackets, overcoats, boots, and gloves, parachuted in from British planes. We had brought bread, brandy, reindeer milk, and meat in exchange for cigarettes, soap, and toothpaste. They would hail us in English, good morning, and we would answer in Finnish, Hyvä Paiva. And then all of us would sit on the grass around a fire of twigs, roast a piece of reindeer meat and drink brandy in silence. Without the usual toasts. We talked little and never of the war. There was a tacit understanding. Never talk of war. No one wished to be reminded that we were enemies. After a couple of hours, we would get up, shake hands in silence, and each would return to his hideout, cabin, or tent. A soft, immense murmuring rose from the grass, from the bushes, from the trees, like the buzzing of gelatinous insects. And the sky curved gently, thickening as it neared the horizon from light green to fleshy pink. It was a feminine sky, sad and pure. That sense of northern abstraction, the impossibility of any heat, smell, or flavor. The air filled with water and stone. That thin, smooth odor of the Arctic not cold, in fact almost warm, but deprived of every animal substance, of every human or vegetable weight, was the dominant element in a landscape of trees, water, clouds.
a landscape of distant prospects, modulated more by musical rhythms than by anything visible to the eye. One's gaze lost itself in the green and pink remoteness of Lake Inari, as if in some atonal horizon, a composition by Schoenberg or an abstract sonata by Hindemith. It was a sky without shadows, clear yet lightly obscured, similar to the insides of certain seashells, where the light is equally reflected from the sea and the sky. creating a separate universe, secret, pure, intact. And as seashells capture the reflection of the sandy shore, of the sky and of the sea, and of the voice of the sea, melting them together in a universe of light and sound like the reflection of an alternate universe, invisible to the eye and inaudible to the ear. So this sky seemed a reflection of a universe far from us, a universe foreign to us, inhuman, a universe of cruel, and impassive abstraction. In certain hours of the day or night when the light came to rest and everything was still dreamlike, suspended over an immobile abyss of lakes, forests, rivers. It seemed then that even this sky had abandoned us. That over our heads shimmered the void. The absolute void of experimental physics. Every smell, every color was extinguished, and we spent long hours sitting by the shore of the lake in that world without smell, without color, without sound. In that landscape of paper, glass, and luminous shadows, of transparent stones and trees, where animals moved as they move in dreams, soundless, colorless, odorless. Then it began to rain again, and that diffuse music of Hindemith, of Schoenberg, would filter down upon us music that was as sad, as lonely, and as deep as a landscape reflected in a mirror. A few miles after crossing the river, we passed the Reindeer Cemetery, a multicolored forest of antlers, brown, green, white sprouting from half-buried skulls, those peculiarly triangular reindeer skulls over which the grass had modestly spread a delicate green cover. I had often gone there alone to wander through this garden of bones with its borders of distant sky and lake. 
and I would lie down among the forested antlers, imagining myself wounded on some remote battleground of history. One of Xenophon's soldiers reclining on the banks of the Euphrates, or a Persian cavalryman abandoned among his dead horses, or a worker stretched out among broken machinery after some failed revolution. And I would rediscover in that grassy garden, scattered with white bones, those things which were most pure, precise, mathematical, and abstract, about that long ago bright morning of defeat on the banks of the Euphrates. That exact feeling of mechanism which the neighing of the king's horses must have inspired when heard from the far shore. The voices of the Greek infantry moving off through transparent air, not yet ripened by the heat of the day. Towards distant mountains hovering blue and white in the finely etched glass of the sky. I would rediscover in that reindeer's graveyard, in that lake shining with the precision of milled steel, those things which were most dry, arid, thin, and at the same time luminous about objects and animals. About polished weaponry, jewels, helmets, chainmail, strips of leather, the wheels of wrecked chariots, the immobile outlines of dead horses and soldiers lying on the silent, hard-packed battleground. I would rediscover in that remote horizon in which the landscape, slightly shrunken, appeared and disappeared like an image reflected in a mirror. Those things which were most precise, essential, functional, and logical about machines and their disemboweled parts, dented wheels, transmission belts, gleaming steel handles, bearings, gauges, gearings, and crankshafts scattered on the factory floor among workers who themselves had been cut loose with all the essential and definitive precision, the unchanging precision of a machine. Those were moments when I felt most detached from humanity. from all those things that humanity contributes to life, to nature, our sensuality and heat, our confusion. But I did not yet know how to value that sense of detachment, that feeling of intimate loneliness, of distance and difference from everything that is recognizably human.